Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to the announcement of the Brain Prize 2019. I'm Lene Skole. I'm CEO of the Lundbeck Foundation. <clears throat> and I don't think I'm overstating anything by saying that uh, this is indeed one of the highlights of the uh, Lundbeck Foundation year. The brain is a key focus area for us. And our philanthropic activities are all about supporting the work of outstanding researchers who make groundbreaking discoveries about the brain, enabling improved diagnosis and treatment of brain disorders. So it's a great pleasure for us to acknowledge some of the world's leading neuroscientists and their transformational brain research today. As the largest private contributor to neuroscience in Denmark, we granted more than 400 million Danish kroner to this field last year. There is a huge need to develop and strengthen brain research, both in Denmark and internationally. And brain diseases are a growing problem, not least due to increased life expectancy. This places a burden on society and it's devastating for those affected and not least for their relatives. Because the brain is not just responsible for a number of bodily functions, speech, thoughts, communication, it is also the home of the human identity. I believe that our focus on neuroscience and the spotlight that the Brain Prize shines on the field every year will eventually help us fulfill our ambition of making Denmark a leading neuroscience nation. I'm also very pleased that we can announce the Brain Prize winners at this ProMemo meeting and that we have some of the prize winners from previous years among the invited keynote speakers. This shows that the Brain Prize is not only growing in prestige and visibility, but that it's, it's a successful and powerful instrument for establishing new networks and collaboration with international within international neuroscience. And now, now it's the time that we've all been waiting for. The announcement of the winners. Just to keep you in suspense for a little bit longer, I will now give you the floor to the director of the Brain Prize, Kim Krosko. Kim, will you please come? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to announce the winners of the Brain Prize 2019, which is awarded to Professors Marie Chemin Bouzer, Hugues Chabria, Anne Choutel, and Elisabeth Tournier Lasserve for the groundbreaking research on the clinical, genetic, cellular, and molecular basis of a brain syndrome known as Catacil. Their achievement is a beautiful illustration of a clinical observation leading to fundamental discoveries about brain disease with implications for the understanding of causes of dementia, migraine, and stroke. Should we give them a hand? <laughs> I think the photo speaks for itself. Here we have the proud Brain Prize winners 2019. 
And now it's my pleasure to give the floor to Professor Anders Björklund, Chair of the Selection Committee for the Brain Prize, who will state the reasons for this year's prize award. Please, Anders. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So, um, as we heard, this year's uh, Brain Prize has been uh, decided to be awarded to four French scientists for the discovery of a clinical syndrome called Cadacil. It may not be well known to you all, but it's a fascinating history showing how an accidental clinical observation can lead to fundamental discoveries that have implications for understanding of brain disease. Uh, Cadacil is a genetic disease affecting the small blood vessels of the brain. A study of its genetic and molecular mechanisms underlying the disease has led to a better understanding of vascular brain diseases in, in general, and it's also given us a better idea of vascular mechanisms leading to other conditions such as dementia and stroke, two of the most uh, devastating diseases of the brain. Uh, this uh, remarkable achievement was made by a closely knit group of clinical and basic scientists working close together over more than 30 years. It's a fine example of how clinical and experimental scientists can collaborate to unravel uh, mechanisms underlying disease. And this is something that the Brain Prize Committee is very keen to award. The story of uh, how Cadacil was discovered and explored, and I, I think we'll hear more from uh, our prize winner later, is an intriguing example of bedside to bench research. That's to say, when clinicians with their patients make observations that somehow lead to insights. And this was uh, made by a young neurologist at the time, Marie-Germaine Boussel, who had a patient walking into her clinic, and perhaps she will tell us more about that as well. And she realized that the symptoms of this patient and his children signaled something significant that should be explored. And together with her co-recipients of the prize, she embarked on a fruitful and highly successful scientific endeavor that step by step uncovered the genetic cause and the underlying molecular and cellular mechanisms of the disease, and then followed by detailed characterization of the resulting pathological changes in the brain as seen in these patients. So we have one of the four prize winners with us today, Marie-Germaine Bouzel. She's a clinic, clinical neurologist, and until 2012, she was professor and head of the neurology department at the Lariboussère Hospital in Paris. She made the uh, critical initial observations. She realized their importance, and she assembled the expertise from various disciplines needed to unravel the secrets of the syndrome. And she named the disease, as we know, Cadacil. As the originator and key player in the Cadacil story, uh, she has been the recipient of numerous awards and is also a leading figure in French neurology. Uh, most fittingly, she was appointed as commander in the French Order of the Legion of Honor in 2013. So on behalf of the Brain Prize Committee, I want to congratulate you and your colleagues to this groundbreaking achievement. And we look forward to hear more from you about this. Please.
Thank you so much, Anders. Uh, now it's no longer a secret that we are in this very fortunate situation that we have actually a prize winner among us today. So now it's my uh, pleasure and privilege to ask uh, Marie Chemin Bouzea to give us just a small glimpse of the Catacil story. Uh, Marie Chemin Bouzea uh, trained at the Paris Sorbonne Medical Faculty and graduated as a neuropsychiatrist in 1972. Uh, she became professor of neurology at the uh, Petit Salpetriere in 1981. In 1989, she became head of the neurology department at Saint Antoine Hospital and vice dean of Saint Antoine Medical Faculty. In 1997, she moved to La, La Ribougiere Hospital, where she became head of the neurology department and professor of neurology at the Saint Louis La Ribougiere faculty. She is now emeritus professor of neurology in Paris Diderot University and honorary head of the neurology department at La Ribougiere Hospital. So please, Marie Chemin, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Dr. Bjorklund. Thank you, all the members of the jury. Thank you, the Lundbeck Foundation, for selecting us. Uh, as you said, we are neurovascular clinicians and researchers. And uh, uh, it's a very, very great honor, particularly when considering the, the list of previous awardees with very, very famous names. So it's a great honor for us four. And it's a great privilege for me today to be able to talk to you about Cadazil on behalf of my three co-workers. So let me introduce them to you. Here, uh, Elisabeth tournier Lasserre. She is a geneticist who worked with me on the first family and found the location of the gene uh, on chromosome 19. And she is now the head of the genetics lab in our hospital and of the genetic basic science uh, lab in uh, our university. Here is, oh, yeah, I knew I was going to be wrong. Uh, here is uh, Anne Joutel. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Here is Anne Joutel. Uh, she was my resident in neurology first, and then she moved to Elizabeth's lab, genetics lab, and that's where she discovered the gene, Notch 3. And now she has her own basic science genetics lab in another her hospital. And she is really a world leader on the preclinical research on Cadazil. Here is uh, Hugues Chabria. Uh, he was also my resident in neurology, and uh, he caught the, the Cadazil virus then, I would say. And uh, he's now my successor at the head of the neurology department in La Riboisière Hospital. And he is really a leader, a world leader, on the clinical research on Cadazil. And, uh, as you can see, it's a very long story, 43 years history. And the first part, in a way, was a kind of French disease. But after the discovery of the gene, it became a worldwide disease. And it is now quite well uh, known that it is the most frequent monogenic small variety, small vessel disease of the brain. But more than that, it is the best model for small vessel diseases, which account for about one third of all stroke, and the best model for vascular dementia, which is the second most frequent cause of dementia. And the, you can see here the number of papers uh, dedicated to Cadazil, an ever increasing number. Alors, pourquoi je n'arrive pas à passer? Maybe I should do that. Yeah, this is the big one, but I am. 
Ah, oh. good. <laughs> Thank you. So you have to stand by me, <laughs> otherwise it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, so uh, Andrew Dell and Hugues, who are really the leaders of the research nowadays, were really young kids in uh, 1976 when, as you said, Dr. Bjorklin, I met uh, the first patient who had an unusual stroke without risk factors and who had uh, this, uh, on this old CT scan uh, small deep infarcts and white matter changes, which were later confirmed on MRI, as you can see. And I was intrigued by this patient, and I offered him to enter our aspirin trial that was running at that time. And actually, I followed him very regularly, actually, until his death, 20 years later, after years of uh, progressive uh, motor deficit, cognitive impairment, uh, complete dependence and dementia. And meanwhile, I had seen his two children who were in their 30s, but already had small ischemic stroke with, as you can see on this MRI, the same kind of lesion, less severe than uh, their father. So it was quite clear at that time that this was a, a genetic disorder. And uh, uh, I was happy to meet Elizabeth who was also a neurologist at first, but then turned to a geneticist and who were decided to work with me on this family. And uh, we were able to uh, study uh, 57 members of this uh, family, and this large family, as you can see here, from the west of France. And we found that 11 of them had already had symptoms and that 19 of them had abnormal MRI. And it is on the basis of this single family that Elizabeth was able to map the gene on chromosome 19. And at the same time, I... It doesn't work when I do it by myself. Where should, where should I? It's... Well, there it is. There it is. There it is. I did it. There it is. Well, I, I suggested the acronym uh, CADASIL because I wanted to emphasize the four main characteristics of this disease, which is a disease of the cerebral arteries, a disease which has a, an autosomal dominant mode of inheritance, and a disease with, as you see, small subcortical infarcts and white matter uh, changes, leukoencephalopathy. Two, three, four. It doesn't work. Ah, okay. and now, now it's getting too far. Uh, now, um, oh, there is one before. Yeah. Uh, so this was 1993, one family. Then the Kadazid story accelerated, and within three years, we were able to gather. 33 French families, and this led, as I already said, Andrew Tell, uh, working in Elizabeth's lab, to identify Notch 3 as the responsible gene. And very interestingly, Notch 3 at that time was not known yet in humans. It was known in the Drosophila, but not yet in humans. And then a genetic test was developed, and then it was again very clear that Cadazil was not such a rare disease and uh, it's uh, present really in everywhere. And um, just to give you an idea of the frequency, just in uh, Elizabeth's lab in La Riboisière, uh, over 1,250 subjects have not three mutations. So it, and, and there are still new cases that have not been diagnosed. Now, there are many, many uh, different mutations, but very interestingly, they are very stereotyped. They all lead to an odd, usually five or seven, number of cysteine residues in the extracellular domain of Notch 3, and I will come back to that. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, after 1996, uh, so 20 years after the first patient, then the research really accelerated and was mostly that of my three co-workers. And Hugues Chabria, as already said, was, is really responsible of the clinical research. And he confirmed what we saw in our first family, that Cadazil is indeed a very severe disease of the brain with purely cerebral symptoms, 
despite the fact that systemic arteries are also involved. And Cadazil usually uh, starts silently. Then, in about half the patient, attacks of migraine with aura occur for many years. And then, around the age of 50, in the majority of patients, ischemic stroke occur, and then there can occur mood disturbances, psychiatric disturbance, and so on, motor disability. And as in my first patient, about 20 years after the first ischemic stroke, patients die after uh, complete dependence and uh, complete dementia. These uh, signs and uh, the characteristic of the uh, cognitive changes with a prominent executive dysfunction the MRI signs with white matter abnormality, silent infarcts, like in a stroke and microbleed, are not just typical of catazil. There are also those, except for migraine, there are also those seen in sporadic small vessel disease, which, as I already said, account for one third of all stroke. So this is uh, very, very important, and this is why uh, catazil is really a model for small vessel disease of the brain and pure vascular dementia. This, <laughs> uh, this led uh, Hugh Chabria to organize with uh, Martin Dischgans in, in Germany the first uh, double-blind randomized clinical trial in Cadazil patients. But the main focus of uh, the clinical research held, uh, led by Hugh is really the correlation between MRI changes and clinical signs. And he showed very important, he made very important observation. First, the clinical severity of Cadazil is related mostly to the accumulation of lacunar infarcts and not to the extent of white matter changes. Second, he showed that Cadazil is not just a subcortical disease, but also a cortical disease with a cortical atrophy and microinfarcts detected on, uh, on MRI. And third, very importantly, he showed that the white matter changes, the leukoencephalopathy, uh, is uh, uh, extremely heterogeneous and with uh, uh, diverse uh, clinical impacts. And this led him uh, really to revisit the concept of leukoencephalopathy and leukoariosis. And I think this, is, this will be very important in the future. And Hugh and his team were also interested uh, on the clinical uh, prognosis of the, of the disease. And they showed that, uh, as in other vascular disease, for instance, uh, smoking and high blood pressure uh, worsen the course of, of Cadazil. And during all these years, uh, Hugh has gathered, uh, uh, organized very good international collaborations to prepare for future treatment trials. But that works. Um, another important thing about the uh, Cadazil story is that it is not just about Cadazil. Uh, in fact, we had families who, uh, uh, in whom uh, no, not, no notch free mutation were found. So they had a different small vessel disease. And this is how the, the Cadazil research paved the way for the discovery of other small vessel diseases of the brain and other genes. And some of these genes were found in our group by Elisabeth uh, Tony Lasserve with uh, uh, Dominique Hervé in our reference center for rare cerebrovascular disease that we have in La Ribosière. So those discovered, uh, identified by Elisabeth are in green and others, as you can see, were identified by other groups. But the very important point is that they all, all these diseases imply proteins of the extracellular matrix. And this leads to what we think is a new concept, the concept of small vessel disease of the brain as diseases of the matrisome. Uh, now, turning to Andrew Tell, uh, I will try and summarize uh, the many, many findings of Andrew Tell, but remember that I'm a clinician, I'm not a basic scientist at all. Uh, so you remember that uh, 
uh, when she discovered the gene, she also found that uh, the mutations were extremely stereotyped, and she showed that this led to the accumulation of the notch 3 extracellular domain around vascular smooth muscle cell and pericytes. Again, this is very important, and uh, again, it brings us to the extracellular matrix and to the matrizome. She also showed, uh, which was not known at that time, the key role of notch 3 uh, in the physiology of the brain vessel for the differentiation of the vessel, their structure and their function. She uh, studied the impact of mutations of notch 3 activity to show that there is an increased activity uh, which is re responsible for the remodeling of the arteries. And she uh, produced over the years several uh, mouse models of Cadazil, and she showed that uh, there is indeed an accumulation of proteins uh, um, which leads to a kind of channelopathy which is underlying the vascular dysfunction responsible for the symptoms of Cadazil. So I think the whole chain is there uh, to understand the, the, the vascular dysfunction that will lead to infarction, cerebral infarction. So uh, I think she has done a really fantastic work. And uh, she has also performed a proof of concept study uh, where she showed that uh, anti notch 3 immunotherapy prevents this vascular dysfunction. So this may be a first step towards uh, studies in, in humans. So this is my last slide. Uh, you asked me to, to give a glimpse on our Cadazil research. I think it's a mini, mini glimpse. Uh, as I said, it has been 43 years uh, of, uh, of story, uh, this story. Uh, and the story which, uh, as you said, was a story of transactional research both ways, uh, going from, a patient, from bedside to bench and from bench to bedside. The story of one patient, which led us to what is the most frequent monogenic variety of stroke, the best model for small vessel disease of the brain, the best model for pure vascular dementia. It has been the, the story of other discovery of other small vessel diseases, which led us to this uh, new concept of diseases of the matrizome. And uh, it has been the story of a lot of international collaboration, illustrated, for example, by uh, the LEDUC network of excellence uh, on small vessel disease that was coordinated in Europe by Anne Joutel. But uh, besides this uh, scientific story, uh, it has also been, at least for me, for 43 years, uh, a fantastic human story, uh, a story of four neurologists uh, of different ages <laughs> with uh, different uh, uh, personalities and uh, with uh, different expertise, but with uh, the same passion and, uh, and the same mutual trust. Uh, it has been the story of uh, many, many friends and co-workers who have helped us to immensely during all these years. And it has been mainly, of course, the story of patients uh, and their families who contributed so much to uh, our research. And in particular, uh, uh, I would like to acknowledge the fantastic collaboration that we had with our first family and that we still have because they are extremely active uh, in our uh, Cadazil Patient Association in France. Uh, without this first family, uh, there would have been uh, no Cadazil story. And to finish, I would like to thank again uh, the Lundbeck Foundation for uh, selecting us. It's, uh, it's uh, fantastic. Uh, we could not believe it when we had the phone calls, really. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's really fantastic uh, for us, uh, fantastic for our country, and fantastic for the neurovascular field in general. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Professor Fusea.
here for this wonderful account of Catasil, the Catasil story. So here we, we end the formal part of the announcement and close the cameras, bringing it live streaming all over the world. So to those of you out there who followed on our website, thank you very much for watching and uh, thank you for your attention.